Bo, welcome to the show. Thank you. So excited to be here. Yes, thanks for taking the time. And I'd like to start with just where you got your start in angel investing. You've done it for a bit. You've had quite the career in different ways. For angel investing specifically, where did you get started with that? Yeah, absolutely. It was kind of through a series of close approximations. Um, so I came to New York five years ago in 2016 to join Tumblr. Uh, and when I came, uh, landed freshly you know, from San Francisco, there was kind of a, a dearth of product-led uh, startups within New York, especially given the lineage of founders tend to come more from marketing and biz dev and sales. Um, so I started advising a lot of these early stage companies, um, pre-series A around like how to make their first PM hire, how to instill good product driven culture and make sure like the DNA of the company was right for experimentation, AB testing, just kind of general scientific method and kind of naturally through that course of advising these founders and winning, you know, their, their kind of respect and showing that I actually had something valuable to add. Um, a couple of them started asking me to write small angel checks to have more skin in the game. Um, and that was kind of how I started just like very small checks to begin with, you know, kind of a advisor plus, you know, type of status as an angel. Um, and it grew more organically after I started putting myself out there as an angel investor. I just want to go back to like the first ones. I know you were helping companies, working with companies, but we find there's a lot of aversion to getting started investing. I don't know why, uh, particularly women, actually. And like, we're trying to increase that more and more. So I'm always curious as to like, what got you like the first one? You're like, oh, no, I'm not going not gonna to invest. You just like, yeah, I want to invest. Like what got you to the over the hump to do it first? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I think to your point, you know, like there's a lot of psychological aspects of angel investing and I've been uh, financially quite like conservative and scrupulous, like throughout all my 20s, like making sure, you know, I put 20% of my paycheck into my 401k and like angel investing is for the uber rich slash like, you know, post economic type of people. So I definitely did not see myself as uh, represented in a lot of the, the angel investing community, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, and I think what got me kind of over the hump was just like meeting a startup uh, named Merit. Actually, they do like mentorship platform coaching. Um, and I had up until that point been doing like advisor equity type of deals and not a pure angel track. Um, and this was a company Gary Chow introduced me to through Orbital, his co-working space in the Lower East Side. And I was just like so in love with the the product driven focus of both founders having come from like BTS, you know, product management and uh, job well CTO background. And I was just like, these are founders that I would just want to back no matter what. Like it was a very <laughs> visceral, like I will have FOMO if I see this company too well in the future. Yep. <laughs> and I think that was more of a, honestly, a, a, a rational compulsion to have more skin in the game than it was just like, give me some advisor equity and I'll be happy, you know, but it definitely, I, I think a lot of people don't talk about like the financial reality of angel investing. And, you know, I had to feel like I was financially stable at a certain point. That's very personal, how you define financial security. But um, I am definitely not recommending people to like, take money out of the 401k or not put money into their retirement fund for the sake of an angel investing track record. Um, but that's just kind of my own personal, uh, you know, money philosophy there. No, I appreciate you sharing that perspective. And yes, I think we agree the same around that. Like it, because of now it just seems so more prevalent around angel investing or alternative investments, you know, outside of maybe the norm air quotes here. So like people are getting more risky on it, but you realistically still kind of like come back to like principles around like how much you actually allocate towards this. And it depends on obviously income and everything, but the interesting thing around it now, and what we're obviously helping with the vitalize is like smaller checks into startups. And you mentioned, you know, getting advisory shares, shares early on, and then eventually doing a little bit more. I mean, were you, what got you to then increase that or continue to invest more, you know, after those first initial one or two, like to then, you know, continue to do more of those and like how the progression go for you from like starting with it to be like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to keep angel investing. I like this thing. I'm going to keep going. I'm curious on how that progressed for you. 
Um, I think it started out more opportunistic. Like if a company really caught my eye, I would evaluate them for angel investing. Uh, and then I started uh, an angel group with like other women uh, in New York and LA. And we started sharing a lot of deals and diligencing things as a group. So then um, I moved more proactively to like, I will allocate X amount of money every quarter for angel investing. Um, so it, it kind of became a more, I would say, like measured type of activity over time. But I definitely started out like, you know, writing 5k checks here and there, and then, you know, trying to, to then figure out, can I get into the more hot deals that other people are competing with through, you know, my human capital and goodwill and credibility. Um, and then I think just the pacing kind of picked up more uh, around the pandemic when, you know, everyone was kind of fundraising around Zoom. Um, and, and it comes in ebbs and flows, you know, like life happens and like, I'm going to get married this year. It's very expensive. So I'm probably going to cut back, you know, my, my deployment of capital because it's my own personal capital and not yeah. like someone else's money. Right. So I do think like, that's where the angel investing has its own like individual ebb and flow. And it's not just like a fund that's just deploying capital X amount, you know, for the next two years. Yeah, I appreciate the perspective. Also, congrats, by the way, <laughs> on that as well. <laughs> that was very exciting. And from that too, like, what are you looking for in terms of companies? Uh, everyone has a different perspective on this. You said opportunistic, but like, even from that, what are you looking for? What, what excites you about these companies too? Yeah, um, definitely. I'm very much a generalist. Uh, I think what catches my eye usually comes from more of like the the characteristic, like the fundamental buildup of the founding team than like I'm super into a certain category. Um, you know, I, I love product driven teams and that comes from my own, you know, bias and background of like doing a decade in consumer product and just realizing there is like a certain scientific method to building your company and like the best um, you know, agile product thinkers are kind of able to iterate through time. So definitely I'm, I'm looking for like a winning team. Like the founding team is so uniquely differentiated that like these are the perfect people to like win. Um, I'm looking for obviously the right market timing. Like, is this a good market entrance for them? You know, you could always have a great team in a bad market and still lose out. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I'm kind of looking at the why, which is like very abstract, but like, why is this the right problem space? What is your own personal alignment? You know, how are you uniquely positioned to kind of, you know, strike when the iron is hot? So I would say it's more the fundamental makeup of the team than like, I'm super into web three deals <laughs> because that's super hot right now. You know, yeah. um, I'm, I'm actually quite averse to like being super on trend. <laughs> like it viscerally makes me shut down. <laughs> so I think it's more about the, the human beings behind all that. With that too, you mentioned the teams. I mean, is there, you obviously made a number of investments over the years here. Is there a team that comes to mind where you, the perfect example of what you mentioned with like this team just seems like they're going to crush it. Like, is there a, a team or a, a group of founders that you're like, this is, this is who I thought was going to, and this is why, and they did. I'm curious about that. I mean, I think people Probably a lot, really so. <laughs> do surprise you. Like, I, I don't think I'm like a mind reader in the sense, you know, I can look at a team and be like, I can predict that in 10, 15 years, like they're going to crush it. Sure. I do think like the, the types of teams that have surprised me are usually ones who have some type of deep IP, like patent penetration. Um, you know, like I, I invested in a company called Triple Blind uh, last year, and they're a data privacy software company that helps you encrypt and protect sensitive data. Um, and they had their own kind of like blind, tri you know, triple blind algorithm around data encryption. And I was just like blown away by the founder and his like deep expertise within this space, but also like his background is very interdisciplinary. Like he was a previous founder who sold his company, you know, to Alibaba. He was, you know, in CBC, like corporate venture before, um, you know, he had a PhD, like deep tech expertise. It, was, it just felt like a consortium of different yeah. 
backgrounds coming together. Um, and, you know, he had a very complimentary COO who had like very different skill sets. Obviously, I was not like, oh, this is going to be the deal that gets like a markup within six months. But like, it was a very solid team that if I were to analyze it as like, you know, are they like the Avengers? They all have something different. Like it was kind of the Avengers team. So um, hindsight obviously is, is 2020. Like I can't predict yeah. the future, but you know, there are amazing humans out there. With that deep product expertise as well that you've mentioned that you've worked in for a number of years, how does that come to light in terms of working with founders? Are you pretty hands-on with founders? I mean, I imagine it could be different, obviously, for different companies, but how much of that is, is a draw for, one, how you work with founders and you know how that actually looks like in terms of month-to-month, -month, whatever questions they have for you? Uh, and then two, I mean, like you mentioned before, getting into deals. How does that play into you getting access to deals too? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think founders who I tend to resonate with and you know we mutually like opt in are ones that do seek out more hands-on support. Like they are uh, product-driven folks who either worked, you know, in engineering or been a part of a product org. So they they really love the ideation process. And like, I love being in that like flow state with them of like, yep. if we're prototyping, if we're thinking of A-B test experiments, if we're thinking about like what that product market fit, like very elusive product market fit looks like, like we can go through that like intellectual, philosophically rigorous process together and they welcome that and realize like that is just, you know, when, when you're kind of in the flow with someone, like you just know it's working. So I definitely think like part of the getting to know them process is like, I'm not prescriptive, but I am definitely like you give me one problem and I'm happy to like help outline 10 different permutations of like how to solve it, you know, and I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I have a really strong social node and social graph with many different nodes of helping you connect to smarter people who are subject matter experts. You know, I always joke like, you know, like in high school, I just was a nerd herder. Like I was not the smartest nerd, but I could congregate <laughs> the smartest people together yeah. around the common Helpful. cause. And I think that is part of the Valley prop of like working with me as an angel is you not only get like a ad hoc, you know, chief product officer, but you also do get access to this larger community of, you know, product execs. And, and I actually did uh, like join and, and started um, leading a product angel group um, through the product leader conference that Ha Nguyen puts on every year. And she uh, kind of, you know, had me take over and run it while she was kind of, you know, busy running and running her own startup. And that was like an introduction into a community of product execs, you know, execs who are at Shopify, at Facebook, at Netflix, who like, wanting to write angel checks and maybe dabble into the world investing, but we're still like operators at heart. So I think I started yeah. holding those pitchathons with this group of product execs, you know, triple one was like one of them. And you basically get to not only tap into me, but a diversified cap table of other product execs and product driven leaders. So I think that was a big appeal. It's like, it's not just Bose check, but also the other, the consortium were really smart product driven people that I can help bring on to the cap table as well. Yeah. And for founders out there, especially now, since there is a lot of capital, I mean, being able to bring someone on like you who has that, it's just such a value add when you think about rounding out your cap table of having a diverse group of investors, people who have domain expertise in different ways. Like if you're smart about it, you can do it. Like there, it's such a value add and it's not going to be like you said, prescriptive, it's not going to be like, it's going to be a burden on you. It's going to be such a huge help, not just the capital. And people are trying to find that more and more and more founders we talk to, you know, they're looking for that. They want value add, actual value add because they can get it now. Which yeah. Is so I would say angels, you know, are kind of like the, they, they can write the cheapest check, you know, on your cap table, but they have like sometimes the deepest bench, you know, in terms yeah. of like the cost uh, you know, effectiveness of having a, an angel <laughs> on your cap table can be like, you know, an order of magnitude that is like 10x to, you know, yeah. just having a check, right, from someone who, who hasn't built anything. So I do think like the whole fractional like angel plus like an extension of your founding team and advisory board is like such a huge 
you know, um, home run for these founders that want to get more out of their early investors. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I, I wanted to bring up, and you, it's a tweet from a while ago, but around uh, parents being tasked with job of survival, self-actualization, the immigrant generational gap is real. What a luxury to search for purpose, meaning, and fulfillment. How does that dictate at all how you angel invest, how you evaluate founders, the, the idea of having immigrant parents, or even looking for people who come from immigrant backgrounds? Like, I'm curious if that, that plays a part in anything as, as an investor, at least for you. Yeah, no, that it is crazy how like I wrote that tweet at my saddest point in 2017 and it just like keeps getting resurfaced as an evergreen piece of content that has like resonated with thousands of people and like an artist even like used it in her comic book cover, like the first page. It, it's incredible. So I just wanted to say like that tweet <laughs> in internet, itself <laughs> is like, it is the people's, it belongs to the world now. <laughs> Um, oh, thank you for that. <laughs> of course. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad my emo angst can sometimes beget some types of universal truism. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do think like the immigrant like survivalist mentality definitely uh, has a double edged sword component. Like I yeah. am more calculated in terms of risk taking than someone who has a trust fund. So I will you know, really like for me to deliberate over an investment decision because it's my own capital, um, that takes a lot more uh, scrutiny and scru scrupulousness, you know, just like, is this wise? Like, how does this play out in my overarching portfolio, you know, of, of other ETFs, stocks, you know, equity that I'm hanging on to. Um, so I think that that is just the Again, I can't stress like the financial reality of angel investing. It's like this should be yeah. your like, you know, fractional portion of your portfolio that is for fun. And you are willing to set that money on fire because it's monopoly money. It may never come back to you. And if you are in the the angel investing seat to make money, um, there are much better asset classes out there. <laughs> there are target funds for you, you know? Um, so I would just you know, kind of think of that as like my primary like baseline. And then from there, you know, it is all about that personal resonance with the founders. And I do think like coming from a first gen background, like I am looking for hunger. I am looking for that, you know, grit and resiliency that you only get from like multiple rejections and like hardships in life where like if you have one setback like you can bounce back really quickly and that actually starts to give you the reps to to really take on challenging tasks and I think like it is a binary thing like you either have grit you don't you either have ambition or you don't and I do like the intersection of like grit and ambition where it's like you're able to to not only have delusions of grandeur but you're able to like follow through and go through your own like heart of darkness journey to build a world-class company. Um, yeah. So I think those are kind of the two intangibles that I've taken for my own, you know, immigration experience um, to kind of evaluate and, and work with uh, gritty and ambitious founders. I, I have to double click on that because you said it's a double-edged sword uh, of sorts. And in one of the tweets you have mentioned, I've, I've delayed so much of life for the sake of work and now it's all catching up. I found it very interesting because I think a lot of people are doing the same thing around working really hard, thinking at the end they're going to chill or working really hard and they get, you know, putting everything off and sacrificing everything. I'm just curious on how you, how you think about that now. I, not that you would change anything going back, but just there's a lot of, you know, ambitious founders, investors, whoever, uh, listen, and I'm curious as to how you've gotten to this point. Lots of therapy <laughs> and and yeah. coaching and just I think like having gone through extreme lows and you know like I, I do think having an ebb and flow in your life like keeps you super humble and yeah. even if you're on your A game, you're not going to be on it forever. So I think it, it's actually in the valleys where I start to get more perspective and be like, oh, this whole like myopically driven ambition by any means, like late stage capitalism game, like is just not sustainable. And that doesn't mean 
I give up and I completely opt out because we, you know, don't have complete agency to just quit capitalism. But I also think like, it gives me some perspective of like, your job is never going to love you back. You know, we are very much like, I think sometimes putting too much of our own identity into one thing. And that is the American way, you know, that's why we're so innovative. We're able to hustle. We're able to like be entrepreneurial, but I think that does come at a cost of, um, you know, if we're thinking about our, our own identity and selves as like a human body, like, you know, I imagine someone who is so career driven, like I was for 10 plus years as like, you have really big bulky muscles in certain ways. And then you're like completely atrophied in other ways. <laughs> like you're, you're like a gym rat in some ways. Like you have these like penguin arms or whatever, but you, you never did leg days, you know, because your whole mindset was like, I need to have the biggest guns and yep. like ever. Right. Um, wow. I did not expect to make a gym analogy. <laughs> Um, but I do think that (laughs) is is how I imagine my life is like, how am I load balancing? And I think the first, you know, decade of my career was very much like myopic. Like I will do everything for the sake of, uh, career progression. And I'm realizing now as I start to get, you know, older and, you know, move into my thirties, I'm like seeing it more holistically and realizing like, some of the best people aren't the most like, you know, successful ones on paper in terms of like the richness of their lives, but yeah. they're able to have a really well balanced, like, you know, just just holistic kind of integrative life. Um, so I think that's that's where I am moving from the achievement mindset to like the manifestation mindset of like. Achieving to me is like you are pedaling uphill in the wrong gear. You know, you're at third gear when you should be at fifth gear. The whole manifestation mindset for me is like you have an intention in the world. You have still a goal and ambition, but you are not willing it single-handedly to come into being. You're thinking about like this alignment with opportunities and with the universe without sounding too new agey, you know, like it may not be the exact iteration of what you thought in your own head, but the outcome may be better than you imagined. Um, And I think I'm at that fulcrum where I'm still toggling between the two, but I'm realizing maybe it's time to like move from sheer will and suffering of an immigrant to like some ease in your life. (laughs) And great things will still happen if you don't just like will everything into being. Um, But you should check in with me in six months to a year and see if I actually follow through with that. I'll set the calendar invite for sure. I think I find so much joy in talking with people, especially who have done internal work, a lot of internal work. And you said therapy. It could be therapy. It could be someone who just journals a lot, someone who meditates a lot, whatever. I love talking to them because like, there's just so much perspective you can get and you get, you continually work through problems or not even problems, just your own, your own experience of life. You continue to work through that by having this, these times to actually think about it. And the times in my life I know, and I have not spent as much time thinking, I'm just like going, I'm like, wait, you step back. Like, what am I doing? And I'm on the completely wrong path. And you're realizing you're climbing the ladder on the wrong building. And that's the worst place to be in. And you only get to that point and you actually do the work to figure this out. I'm going to tie this all back, I swear, to angel investing and startups and everything as well. Because the founders need to understand what they're building and where they're trying to get to. And some of the most you know, mission-driven people, I always think of like Ruben Harris and Career Karma, so mission-driven what they're doing. And that fuels them and also brings people in to what you're doing. Tying this back to you and your journey, you start Silicon Valley Bank not too long ago. How did you get to that point of joining them, knowing that was the next step in your career? Yeah. Um, I had a mentor actually like, give an analogy of how I'm like a comet in terms of my career. Like I entered the centripetal orbit of large planets, you know, organizations that have a specific like void for me to fill. Uh, And, you know, being a super hungry, ambitious person, if that alignment isn't there, I will move on to the next planet. And I, I think this planetary like framework applies when it comes to career pathing, because 
um, you know, opportunities come into our own orbit at times. It could be the right timing. It could be not. It could be your ideal thing. It could be not. And and I I think I you know to your point of like the deep introspection of of kind of personal growth. Like I did a lot of reflecting on like where do I get the most energy and alignment with the type of work that I do with founders. You know, um, in my last job, and I realized like. The joy I got was not just for like from winning over a term sheet or, you know, wiring money. It actually came from like being in the trenches with these mm-hmm. founders, uh, troubleshooting, thinking through, you know, like that, that like heart of darkness journey with them and, and being able to like essentially be a co-pilot at times. Um, and, and that deep resonance like made me kind of realign my intentionality of like, I don't have to be in a pure VC role or a pure operating role. Like Silicon Valley Bank is kind of the perfect financial partner within the innovation economy because we're sitting between founders, VCs, hedge funds, PE firms, like you are in the consortium and the orbital like pull of all of these different like players in the innovation economy. And when the opportunity came, um, I realized it was just such a good, not only personal and professional alignment, but spiritual alignment of like, I've always enjoyed doing all of this hands-on stuff as an investor. And now I get to have the honor of doing that with our clients who, you know, in New York are like 1600 plus startups. Um, and I get to figure out how to, deploy my time and invest in, you know, the companies that need the most help. So um, I do think like the role very much like aligned with me in so many personal, professional, spiritual aspects. And it was about finding the right environment so that I could have enough oxygen in the room, be able to like show up as Bo, you know, the confidant and friend to startups instead of Bo the corporate banker. And I think that's the beauty of SVB is, you know, we are a consortium of folks who come from the financial industry, folks who come from startups, folks who have been in venture, and we surround our founders with this human layer of support that goes beyond just like, you know, commoditized like banking, right? Um, So I'm, you know, super happy and and delighted to to kind of be at the epicenter of like the innovation economy with SVB. I appreciate the perspective. This has been great, Bo. Thank you for the time. Where's the best place for people to connect with you online if they'd like to? You can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm at Bo Safina, B-O-S-E-F-I-N-A. And, you know, my DMs are open. So I love the serendipity of the internet. So definitely that's how you and I connected. That's how uh, some of the best founders and friends I met are online to IRL friends. <laughs> so I am a child of the internet. You can find me on there. I love it. Thank you so much for the time today, Bill. Really appreciate it. Of course. All right. Take care. Bye.